Okay, the meeting is now being recorded, so everything that you type into the chat, um, everything that you type into the chat box will be permanently recorded. I'd like to welcome you to this is uh, October 17th. Our presentation, Christy Sullivan is going to be uh, jumping in here and presenting in just a few minutes on uh, creating woodland pools for wildlife. I'd like to uh, welcome you all to this event. I'd also like to uh, make a special note of appreciation to Cornell University Cooperative Extension who provides access to this web conferencing software free of charge. Um, as I was mentioning earlier, there are uh, continuing forestry education credits available for this workshop. And if you have not signed in with CF after your name, um, right now I have uh, uh, four foresters signed up, Martin, Ron, Sally, and Terry. If there are any others who want to be recorded, um, that I'm, I need to see what I need to do is document your participation today in an email to the Society of American Foresters. So uh, pop something in, um, pop something into the chat box so that that I know that you're a forester and want to receive continuing education credits. Okay, let's um, before we get into the actual presentation, I'd like to take a, a minute as we always do. Okay, Leslie has, um, sorry. Lesic has no sound. Um, I think other people have sound. Can I get, uh, can somebody confirm that there's sound? It may be that you're, uh, okay, so there's at least a couple other people have sound. If you're, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, if you have a dial up modem, uh, you're going to have trouble with sound. Uh, or maybe your speakers aren't plugged in, or maybe you need to go to the meeting pull-down menu in the top left corner um, and, and act, run through the audio setup wizard. Okay, let's, um, let's jump to our first poll, and these are... Um, these, are these are quick and easy. It should just take a few seconds. Um, for you to do this, I need you to please sign in and let me know. Uh, there are two two separate questions here. The first two is uh, you, you answer one or the other about whether this is your first forestry webcast or whether you've participated in previous ones. And then the bottom section of five questions is what your history has been with in with in-person workshops or seminars and how frequently you've been to those. And what we're trying to do with this is trying to determine whether people that are participating in webcasts or what per, what proportion of the people that participate in webcasts um, are, are doing this as their primary mode of, of education. So, I mean, answer truthfully, it doesn't make any difference what the answer is, but we just need to know so that we can, we can gauge how we're providing, um, how, how we're providing uh, education. All right, so we have 23 people out of 36 who have taken the poll. So if the rest of you could please uh, do that, we'll, we'll let this run another 20 or 30 seconds, or 25 out of 36. Okay, we have another nine people, excluding Christy and I, so seven other people that will hopefully be signing in here. Okay, because once I close the poll, I'm going to close the poll in a couple of seconds, so please sign in. Once I close the poll, uh, we cannot go back. Okay, going once, going twice. All right, that poll is closed, and we'll have another quick poll, and then we'll turn this over to Christy. And this one's hopefully even easier. You only have one thing to look at here. This is how many acres of forest land you own or manage. So for the foresters, if you could give a sense of how many acres you manage, for forest owners or for educators, how much you own, how much you manage. OK, 
okay. We have we're at 25 out of 36. Looks like there's about nine people that aren't aren't taking the polls. If you could go ahead and take those polls, please. This is helpful to us. Okay, going once. Closing the poll. Okay, with that, uh, we'll have another poll at the end, so stick around. Uh, I want to turn this over to Christy. Christy Sullivan's a, a colleague in the Department of Natural Resources here at Cornell University, and um, she's got a, a lot of experience both uh, from a research perspective as well as a practical perspective on, on uh, creating and protecting and the ecological function of woodland pools for wildlife. So with this, I'm going to turn the, the speaking option over to Christy, and I'm going to turn my microphone off, and then she will uh, she will lead you through today's presentation. So Christy, welcome. The, the floor is yours. All right. Thanks very much, Pete, and welcome, everybody. Um, I'm going to be talking, as Pete mentioned, about creating woodland pools for wildlife, but it's going to be um, quite a bit more broad than that. Um, first, I want to talk about what a woodland pool is and then talk about why they're important and uh, why they, they're a really important type of habitat. And then we'll go through um, how you can recognize and protect existing wetland or woodland pools. And then, uh, so what if you don't have woodland pools on your property or, or land that you manage? Um, you know, can you create woodland pools in those areas to provide good habitat? The first thing I wanted to mention is what's the difference between a vernal pool and a woodland pool? I think right now everybody hears the word vernal pool or the words the phrase vernal pool thrown around quite a bit. And vernal pools typically um, are uh, define a type of uh, wet area that's most common, I think, in the, the Midwest. It's more of an open habitat um, that is seasonally flooded, usually in the springtime. And that's where the word vernal comes into play. Um, on the other hand, in the Northeast, in our forests, we have woodland pools that are similarly um, flooded seasonally, but we oftentimes have water in those pools, not only in the springtime, but also uh, oftentimes in the fall as well, with those pools drying up in uh, drier summer months. Um, but they do reach their maximum depth um, lots of times, both in the spring and in the fall. So there are three components. Um, that help us to define a woodland pool. And they are the setting that the pool occurs in, uh, the water, and uh, third, the wildlife. The setting of a typical woodland pool is that it's small in size, oftentimes less than two acres. Uh, they're typically isolated. So I like to think of them as kind of an oasis in the middle of the, of the forest. Um, and they're, um, again, typically surrounded by forest in a forest, forested setting. In terms of water, um, these areas typically don't have any permanent inlet or outlet of water. So you don't have water flowing into the pool, and you don't have water flowing out of the pool. So they're kind of isolated. Um, sometimes the, the pool uh, water comes from a runoff or snow melt, and just it sits in that little uh, depression. Other times it can be groundwater fed, so you can have water seeping into that low area. The picture on this slide, uh, you can see there, there's a whole uh, group of people sitting on the log in uh, what is a vernal pool during the dry season. So you can see there's a little shallow depression, but, um, but there's, uh, there's no water in it currently. And feel free to ask questions at, at any time if you have any questions. Um, these, so these pools often you know, will have a wet and dry cycle. And they don't necessarily dry out every year, but they may dry out every few years. Or some do dry out um, you know, very regularly, like on an annual cycle. So here I just wanted to show you a picture uh, of a vernal pool or a woodland pool in all uh, three different seasons. The upper left is winter. Uh, you can see it's kind of covered with ice there. And you can see the log that goes across. And if you look in the, the center there, you see a picture of the same pool uh, during the springtime and then uh, the identical pool during the summer. 
The third way of defining a woodland pool is by looking at the wildlife that, uh, that inhabits the pool. So basically letting the organisms define the habitat. Um, these woodland pools provide breeding habitat for um, particularly for amphibians and invertebrates. And so they're very important uh, habitats for these animals. They also provide foraging habitat for a variety of other species. Um, the picture down in the, the kind of lower left there is a picture of a raccoon track that I found at one of our woodland pools at the Arnott Forest. Um, you know, a lot of animals come to feed at these areas um, or come to get water. We've had uh, turkeys coming to really shallow parts of the pool during, uh, during the summertime and, and deer coming to the pool. There's the whole variety of different wildlife species that will use, um, use that, those types of areas. Um, and another characteristic of these woodland pools is that, is that because they're not permanent bodies of water, they don't support fish populations. And I'll, I'll get into uh, why that's important a little bit later on. I just wanted to show you some pictures of some of the animals that use woodland pools. Um, this is uh, particularly um, a particularly important group of organisms that use these pools, um, the mole sal salamanders. This is a group of salamanders that uh, typically spend a lot of their time underground in the forest, uh, but do come to woodland pools in the springtime to breed and lay eggs. So they really are only there for a very short period of time. Uh, they lay their eggs, they leave the pools, and uh, then those eggs remain in the pools to uh, develop and grow into larvae. And then those larvae, which are little kind of tadpole-looking organisms, uh, emerge from the pools and move to the forest a couple months later. Uh, some of the mole salamanders we have in New York State are the uh, blue spotted salamander, which is up in the in the upper left corner, um, the Jefferson salamander, which is in the upper right corner, the marbled salamander down in the lower left, and then probably the one we're most familiar with is the spotted salamander down in the lower right. Um, you know, a lot of people. I've I've been out in the woods uh, on woods walks with people and found these, especially spotted salamanders sometimes under a log or in a moist, uh, really moist, decayed log. And, and uh, they can get to be uh, quite large. And people are often astonished that these animals are out there. They kind of look a little bit prehistoric, even. Uh, so they're really neat creatures. And uh, kids especially find them, um, find them to be very interesting. And so these animals are considered obligate or indicator species for woodland pools. Some others that use woodland pools and are considered obligate species are the wood frog. And the wood frog is, uh, again, a very common organism in New York State. They come to the pools. They're the first breeders in the spring. They'll move to our woodland pools sometimes uh, the end of March or beginning of April. Sometimes there's still snow and uh, ice cover on parts of the pools when they move in. Uh, they breed during a very uh, tight, short period of time, maybe just within uh, a week or so, they all will kind of synchronize, and then they move back out into the forest. The fairy shrimp is also um, an obligate species, a, a small, it's about a, an inch long shrimp. Okay, in addition to those obligate species, we have a lot of uh, what we refer to as facultative species, so species that aren't really completely dependent on that type of habitat, but will use it. And uh, that kind of applies to a lot of our frog species, uh, animals like the spring peeper, or the green frog. The American toad will sometimes lay eggs in woodland pools. Uh, the gray tree frog, uh, especially uh, for the gray tree frog when it's in an area that's, that's near an, another an open area of habitat. Uh, some other species, um, some of our turtles, like the spotted turtle, um, is uh, an animal, and the wood turtle as well. That um, when they they come out of hibernation uh, after the winter in the springtime, they'll come to these areas to feed. Um, you know, these areas have a, a lot of uh, a lot of activity, and so they're a great place for these animals to kind of stop over and fuel up before moving on after hibernation. 
Some other facultative species are, uh, there are quite a few invertebrates, things like isopods. There are um, damselfly and dragonflies that use these areas. They, they lay their eggs in the water and then their, their, um, their eggs hatch and develop in the water before they emerge and, and move to, to the land and the air. Um, and things like uh, the water boatmen and um, other, other beetles. So many of our uh, woodland pool dependent species in New York State are on the list of species of greatest conservation need uh, in the New York Comprehensive Wildlife, in the Comprehensive Wildlife Conservation Strategy. So a lot of people have likened woodland pools to coral reefs in the ocean, basically areas where there is uh, a large prey base, so a lot of food, and that in turn attracts a lot of predators, things that are feeding on the, that prey base, and um, they are like very critical areas uh, of uh, biomass and an exchange of energy from the uh, from these little aquatic areas up into the upland. You know, things from the forest come in, feed in at these woodland pools, and then move back out into the forest. So it's just a really interesting uh, kind of dynamic in the forest. In addition to providing great habitat, what I've found is that people uh, really love to come to these places just to uh, to view wildlife and. To, to look for animals on their own. So it can be, you know, an additional way of enjoying your property or taking your family out to, uh, to uh, explore nature. And so they have those uh, extra added benefits as well. Okay, so now we know what woodland pools are and, uh, and why they're important. Um, I just wanted to mention that um, there are a lot of different reasons that uh, vernal or woodland pools have been lost in New York State over time. And it's a whole variety of, of um, different activities that have led to a decline in these habitats. Uh, the first that I would mention is uh, development, and basically um, you know, uh, housing developments and whatnot that can fragment habitat. Uh, and um, can also, you know, lead to some other impacts on these areas. Um, also, agriculture. Lots of times, these areas uh, might be just, you know, low depressions, or if you don't um, see or understand their importance, um, they can often be overlooked or just be considered kind of little mucky, wet areas that are kind of waste areas, and uh, so they've uh, ruined by um, having direct activity within the pool basin. Um, also, some people, you know, if you see an area that has a wet depression and, and people would like to create a pond, they often look to those shallow areas as ways, uh, you know, indication that there's water there and the potential for a pond. So lots of times these areas are, are uh, deepened to create larger permanent ponds. And the issue with this is that um, I mentioned before that fish can't live in temporary water. And that's very important for those woodland pool organisms that are dependent on those habitats because uh, for the most part, things like uh, the mole salamanders and wood frogs, they lay their eggs and those eggs have to develop very quickly. Um, the larvae or tadpoles um, need to be out feeding constantly to grow fast enough to move out yet during that season. And because of that, they're very obvious. They're out in the water column feeding uh, very continuously and they're very obvious to fish and other predators. Fish will, will feed regularly on them. Um, so when you have fish, then oftentimes it, it kind of precludes populations of those uh, woodland pool organisms from being successful and, and uh, surviving basically to move out of the water and onto land. So uh, whenever you create permanent water um, out of a temporary water source, you're really changing the habitat so that it's not um, not really uh, beneficial to a whole group of organisms. Um, other things that disturb woodland pools are things like um, ATV use in woodland pools. You know, they look like a fun place to go drive through. Um, when people, you know, aren't um, aware of the importance of them as habitat. Um, and things like uh, changes in water levels from a variety of different 
types of activities, including things like stormwater management. Um, Saul, I see you have a question about uh, where fairy shrimp come from and where do they go when the pools dry up. And uh, that's a very good question. Actually, I'm not quite sure how they get there. Uh, I think that they can withstand a certain amount of drying. So they may be down in the soil and um, can probably withstand drying for you know a period of time. But uh, that's a really good question um, that I don't really know the answer to. OK, another reason why woodland pools um, you know, we're concerned about them is because they really don't have any protection. Unlike other wetlands um, throughout the Northeast, there really aren't very many uh, states or areas that have good protection for woodland pools. There's no federal protection because um, they're isolated wetlands. And federal wetland regulations protect um, waters that, that wetlands that flow into the waters of the United States. So basically wetlands that are connected to other bodies of water. Um, in the state of New York, um, our wetland regulations protect large, um, large wetlands that are 12.4 acres or larger. Um, and also, they, it protects a 100-foot buffer around them. But as you can see, 12.4 um, you know, acres is a rather large wetland. And a lot of our wetlands, um, as well as woodland pools, are um, much smaller than that. So a lot of our wetlands in New York State are not protected by state regulations. Um, other wetlands that are protected by New York State law are uh, wetlands that appear on freshwater wetlands maps, and um, also some that have some species of special concern, threatened or endangered species. But for the most part, woodland pools are, are not protected. So I think uh, you know, it's very important that through education, you know, we try to spread the word about the importance of these areas so that people can voluntarily conserve them. OK, looks like some in interesting information on the, in the chat box about uh, fairy shrimp from Leszek. The western United States is home to many species of fairy shrimp, five of which are threatened or endangered list them there. Demic to the west coast. Very interesting. Thank you very much. And Pete has added some information about fairy shrimp there at uh, vernalpool.org. OK, so um, you know what can you do, or what can I do, what can we do? Um, to protect these valuable habitats and the organisms that depend on them. Uh, the first thing um, that we can do is to protect existing woodland pools. Uh, we have them or if we're aware of them. And then the second would be if, if you don't have them on your own property and you'd like to provide that type of habitat, you can create new pools. Just some guidelines for protecting existing pools. Um, First, to start with, probably the most obvious, is to keep the pool basin itself, um, as well as the vegetation and the water quality, undisturbed. So um, doing what we can to uh, prevent uh, things from entering the water that, that would uh, be harmful to the organisms that live there. So that would include uh, you know, pesticides and whatnot. And just um, Prevent disturbance of the vernal or the woodland pool basin. Not uh, not only when there's water there, but also in times um, you know in the summertime when it may be dried up. So it's kind of important to do a little reconnaissance maybe in the springtime and try to identify where the pools are and then uh, mark them. Or uh, if they're going to be any there's going to be any type of management activity, maybe mark the boundaries of those those basins so that when it does dry up during the summertime. Uh, you can still be aware of where the uh, basin is so that it can uh, remain protected. I mean, another thing, just looking at the topography, sometimes you can tell. You can see the depression on the forest floor. Um, you can also tell because oftentimes the leaves at the bottom of the basin will be kind of stained black. And, um, and once, you, once you learn what, it, what to look for, it's, it's pretty easy to identify them. Another uh, something else that's important is to 
maintain or encourage a mostly closed canopy in pole or greater size class surrounding um, the pool. And the reason that it's important to keep uh, a mostly closed canopy, uh, there are many reasons, but one is to provide shade for these organisms so that um, mostly so that the, the water um, doesn't dry up too quickly if it, there's uh, too much um, sun hitting, hitting the pool. To provide a deep litter basin, so when the leaves fall from the trees, the, the leaves fall into the pool, and those leaves become a source of food for invertebrates that are going to break down the, the leaf matter and then um, and feed on that. And then the invertebrates, in turn, provide food for amphibians and other things that might come um, to feed on the, um, on the invertebrates. OK, Bob has asked, why no deep ruts or exposed soil? OK, so that comes next to not creating deep ruts right around the vicinity of the pool and not exposing mineral soil. Um, and erosion, too. And I guess I'll address all three of these and hopefully um, answer Bob's question. But basically, a lot of these animals, if you look at the little picture of the spotted salamander on the right, that's a, a recent metamorph. So that's a larva that's just kind of changed and is emerging from the pool. These are very small organisms, and they're moving out from the pools into the forest. And something like a, a deep rut can be um, can be a barrier to these animals that actually prevent them from being able to move out away from the pool, or can detain them long enough that you know they uh, become a source of prey very quickly. So it makes them vulnerable as they move away, and also can just base completely uh, prevent them from from moving out from the pool. Uh, the exposed mineral soil is important because amphibians uh, need to stay moist. They, they are prone to, to drying out or desiccating. A lot of them uh, breathe at least partially through their, uh, through their skin. And um, so maintaining their moisture and not drying out is uh, very important to these organisms. And where you have exposed mineral soil, it's generally um, you don't have the, the moisture and the protection that you would if you had an organic soil. Um, these organisms will sometimes you know, move along below, just below the leaf litter uh, out into the forest floor. It gives them a place to uh, uh, basically a, a cover and protection as they move away. Okay, so it's um, the reason that it's important to maintain a, a buffer of upland habitat surrounding the woodland pools. Um, is that the surrounding forest really supports most of these species for much of their life cycle. As I've mentioned, uh, things like mole salamanders and wood frogs, they're only really using these pools for, for a very brief period of time. And then the rest of, uh, of their life cycle is completed out in the forest. So these are really forest species. And if you look at the graph that's, um, that's on the screen there, you can see um, this graph comes from a publication that was uh, kind of summarized a lot of research that's been done on these animals. And you can see that the spotted salamander um, in the literature, it's, it's been shown that they move out about 300 uh, or up to 386 feet um, from the woodland pools. Uh, the Jefferson salamander was found up to 477 feet away from the woodland pools. And the wood frog moves uh, quite a distance. They move uh, in the literature. They were shown to move. Um, almost 4,000 feet from the pools that they um, that they bred and laid their eggs in. So you can see that the surrounding habitat is very important too. So lots of times, you know, the immediate 100-foot buffer surrounding a pool is considered like the critical buffer zone, and uh, it's, it doesn't mean that no um, activity can take place there, but just means that that's a place to pay extra attention to things like the exposed mineral soil, the deep ruts, um, the closed canopy, um, etc. They uh, also, because of the amount of uh, the distance away from the pools that organisms use um, out into the forest, they also recommend like a 300 foot protection zone where where you also just try to maintain a, a mostly closed canopy. And there are guidelines, um, especially for um, forest management um, and timber harvesting. There's a, a publication out there 
that uh, has best management practices and that that'll be on a, a website that I'll recommend later on a link to that publication so um, you know it doesn't have to be if you do the calculations you do the math uh, three or four hundred foot buffer around even a small pool is a large acreage so it doesn't necessarily have to be an entire circle around the pool. there has to be at least you know an area or one side that can provide that type of Okay, um, forest fragmentation, um, as you can, as pictured in this slide, um, has the potential to really isolate pools from one another and create barriers that um, can contribute to reduced populations. Uh, you can see that as, uh, for instance, as a development goes in, it cuts off habitat, uh, certain areas of habitat from others. And so if you could picture that you had a woodland pool down in the left-hand corner and one up in the right, upper right-hand corner, that once that development went in, they'd be effectively you know, isolated from each other. There's a housing development might be um, a pretty, pretty big barrier to an uh, animal like uh, a wood frog or, or particularly maybe the mole salamanders. See, Bob mentioned down here those might be average radii. radii. Um, yeah, uh, you mean for the the mole salamander image? And that's that's probably that uh, correct. Okay, so you want to um, avoid isolating existing pools from one another, and um, this is um, you know uh, something to think about when not only when you're protecting existing pools, but if you plan to create. Uh, of your own, just in terms of you know the distance to other source populations, the distance to other similar habitats. Um, you know, if you have a, a group of pools in an area, um, you're much likely to, uh, much more likely to have um, healthy and secure local populations of these animals. Because if if one or two of the pools, for instance, doesn't hold water long enough in a season to produce any young, then you know you have the others as fallbacks. And um, you know, if something would happen to one of the pools, uh, it would be you know, detrimental. What happened to one of them? You still have the others to rely on. So um, it's kind of important to uh, maintain connections uh, of pools to one another, and um, you know, through connections of, of forest habitat. So you can see how in the um, in this area here we have. A roadway that goes through might, uh, might destroy a couple of those pools and also isolates them, effectively isolates them from one another, the remaining uh, pools that are still there. So that brings us to, okay, if you have woodland pools on your property, um, those are some tips for protecting those existing pools, but what if you don't have any pools on the property that you own or manage? Um, and you'd like to create some habitat, uh, enhance the habitat you have for wildlife um, on that property. And this is something that we've um, undertaken quite a bit at the Arnott Forest, which is our teaching and research forest um, in the Department of Natural Resources here at Cornell. Um, we've uh, done a lot of um, creating woodland pools and we've, we've tried a variety of different methods, so it's something that we have quite a bit of experience with. And uh, I think the first and probably most important thing is to kind of think through the process. So you want to think about, do you have a suitable location? You know, do you have an area that's uh, likely to hold water, that uh, has some forest habitat surrounding the area, uh, that's near enough to uh, other potential uh, woodland pools uh, that you know, once you put your pool in, they'll be It'll provide habitat for animals that disperse from those other pools. Um, those questions like that. Um, you also want to think about what resources do you have to invest? Do you have a lot of time, but but not much money to invest? Do you have uh, more money than time? Um, you know, what are your limitations, and and what uh, what do you have that you you're willing to or can invest in an activity like this? And then also. Um, once you decide that, that you are going to go ahead with a pool, um, creating the pool, then 
you can think about what features you can add to maximize the benefits um, that you're providing to wildlife. And so the first step is to um, think about whether or not you have an adequate source of water. And the two sources of water that uh, you can depend on, um, two different options might be groundwater. So if you have uh, groundwater that seeps to the surface in, in a particular area, then that might um, be enough to provide uh, water during the spring and the fall. Um, and then, um, or maybe surface water runoff is, is it a, do you have a location where um, rain flows uh, regularly downhill into a, a flatter area or snow melts uh, that might provide the water source that you need. This is a, an image of some pool locations at the, the Arnott Forest. This pond here was, was an existing pond that we had at the Arnott Forest. It was a permanent pond. And what you don't see, though, is that um, over kind of in this area is um, an, an overflow for the pond that really functions as a woodland pool. And so that um, provides habitat for those animals, even though that habitat isn't really provided in the permanent pond because uh, it does have fish. Uh, so these up here, these smaller dots, are pools that we put in on our own. And uh, to, um, to try to research whether or not we, had, uh, we would have enough water supply, we spent some time um, the year before just kind of uh, monitoring these areas. Uh, we could tell that there was water that seeped to the surface in the springtime in all of these areas. We actually dug a few, uh, few holes and put PVC pipe down in vertically um, so we could see down below ground where the water level was and kind of monitor how close it got to the surface. And based on, on um, both that monitoring that we did and also the position of those areas in the landscape, you can see that um, you know, this is a, a higher area up here and it's pretty steep, uh, a pretty steep hillside coming down here and it really flattens out where these lines are further apart. Uh, our flatter areas where they're close together are steep areas. You can kind of see that the water would flow kind of downhill into these areas off the hill slopes. So, um, so based on that information, we went ahead and put some pools in. Um, another thing that, that you want to consider are, um, are there source habitats nearby? Um, if you live in the middle of a, of a suburban development, um, you may or may not have other pools nearby that might be able to um, be a source of animals moving into your pond. So, so the landscape that surrounds the area where you uh, create your pool is going to have a lot to do with what animals you can expect to eventually move into your, your woodland pool. Um, and it's, as I showed before in the, the slide about isolating habitats, um, if you have clusters or complexes of these pools um, in, a, you know, in an area, then you're more likely to provide you know, consistent long-term habitat for, for these animals. The fourth step is to determine how will you construct your pools um, once you know where you're, they, uh, where you're going to put them and that you um, have a setting that's that's going to be um, that's going to work for you you need to determine how how to, de to develop them so uh, three types of uh, ways that we've created pools at the Arnott Forest is uh, one to dig them by hand with a, a lot of labor um, hand dug with shovels by us and some interns um, uh, or you can hire somebody specifically to come in and uh, using heavy equipment to to construct a pool for you, or you can construct them as part of other forest management activities. And we've done that as well. We've had, you know, while we're having a, a timber harvest, we've asked the, the uh, logger to, you know, put the blade of the skitter down as they, as they leave, um, just, you know, push out a very shallow area. And we found that that works very well, at least in our setting. I just wanted to show you how we created the, uh, the hand dug pools, the, the system that we used. Now ours were done, dug for research purposes as well as for um, habitat enhancement. So we wanted the pools to be all the same size. So what we did was we kind of planned it out ahead of time. 
and we formed you know how how large and how deep and we created a template out of a tarp so uh, using the tarp we drew we wanted concentric rings uh, these inner rings these inner rings were the deeper areas and so we cut those out then um, we uh, drew concentric rings of uh, that indicated other uh, depths that were a little more shallow around the center pools and then the last so we had two other tiers that kind of went around like this and you can see we cut out uh, little slits in the tarp and then we put it down in an area put flags inside the holes and then lift the tarp up and I think there's a picture later on. Here we are in the forest where we were creating our pool. We put the tarp down, put the flags in, and then we raised the tarp so the flags were remaining and we'd start in the center in the deepest part and uh, move out as we went, went along. And here is the result of uh, one of our hand dug pools. This is um, basically we, we have just finished digging the pool and you can see that in, in this area we had water moving in very quickly so in fact as we were digging the deepest part um, we oftentimes had uh, water moving in and uh, we had green frogs actually that moved in before the pool was even complete. So. And here's that same pool um, just by the end of June, so by the end of that month. And so you can see that by hand digging, you, you make, uh, you don't really impact the surrounding habitat too much. So it really resumes its natural looking state very quickly. It's very aesthetic. Um, what we did was we, even with the hand dug pools, we reserved the topsoil in a separate pile as we took it off. And then we put that back on around the edges. And that way the seed source for the plants um, that was contained within that topsoil was uh, put right back on around the edge and that enabled the vegetation to grow up uh, very quickly and for it to look very natural uh, as well. Okay, so in addition to drawing or digging by hand, which is very labor intensive, um, you can also create as part of an ongoing management activity. And this is uh, one of those woodland pools that I mentioned that was created on a skid trail following a, har a timber harvest. And uh, this is one, of the, one area that um, really supports a lot of organisms and has been very successful habitat enhancement. And then the third option is to hire someone to create a pool for you. And this is another option that we uh, tried out at the Arnott Forest. We had uh, somebody come in. Um, we asked to try to keep as small a footprint as possible and that we had heavy equipment in there. We didn't want to mo remove any more trees than we needed to right in the area. And um, let's see, Steve has a question, a comment. Once you do the skid trail method, I assume it precludes use of the skid trail in future harvest. Um, it probably, it would be uh, more difficult to use that skid trail in the future um, without disturbing the organisms that, that uh, that we're using that pool. I mean, even in it, when once it dried out. So, um, I suppose it could be reused, um, but um, probably I wouldn't recommend it. And so once the uh, the holes were dug or the the contour was created for the pools, um, then uh, as I mentioned before, we had the, the topsoil set aside in a separate pile. And um, and then was placed back on the edge. Let's see. Pete here says, but the berm could be removed and reestablished after the second harvest. Uh, yes, it could, and that would be um, that would be that would work fine for reusing. Um, the only downside there would be right the, the potential damage to the organisms that had colonized there over time and the organic. Uh, material that had accumulated on the bottom serving as a food source. So you kind of it would kind of be like um, you, you would be setting it back quite a bit and would kind of be like starting over. But it could be done and, and you know maybe a better option than not having any pool at all. Okay so this is our one of our pools that was created 
um, you know, purposefully with uh, heavy equipment. It was actually created with a bulldozer. Um, one of the, the logger that was in doing one of our um, timber harvests, he was using a bulldozer and he, you know, very carefully excavated these pools. And they, um, it filled in. You can see this is by, so the, the pool, the picture from the previous slide, I'll go back to that. Actually, two slides ago. That was in August, and the pools have filled, you know, com almost completely by June the next year. And then this is what it looked like by August of that year. So, you know, uh, one year later, um, again, by replacing the topsoil around the berm, you really had a lot of the vegetation coming back, and it really uh, didn't look, you know, like a very disturbed site at all. And I just wanted to show you a comparison of the different methods of creating a pool. So if you dug the pool by hand, um, the time and energy, and uh, take my word for this, is very high, uh, your investment of time. Though, you know, you could have a party, invite the family and friends over. If you have uh, teenagers, have them invite some friends over and have a, a woodland pool digging party. Um, but the money, the investment of, in terms of money is, is very low. Uh, you probably are limited to a smaller pool in, in that case because uh, you know you're, you can only dig what time and and your energy will allow. Um, if you hire somebody to come in and create the pool, you, the time investment uh, for you personally is probably low to medium. Um, it's going to be the most costly method, but you'll be a lot, you'll be um, able to create you know a medium to large size pool. And then if you create a uh, pool as part of another activity, then uh, it's a low amount of t investment of time, a low investment of money, small to medium sized pool. So it's very, um, in terms of resources, it's a very efficient method of creating. Um, let's see, Linda, you've asked how long did the woodland pool digging take and how many people? Um, I think we figured that um, two of us supervisors and two interns, those smaller pools took about four person days. So um, take us a, an entire eight hour day with four people or one person could maybe do it uh, in four days, although I, I wouldn't recommend, wouldn't necessarily recommend that. It's more fun to do with other people. Okay, the fifth step is um, you know, when you create a woodland pool, you want to try to create a, a variety of depths and hydro periods. So basically, what we did was we had part of the pool. So this side, let's see, over on that end, it was really um, about two and a half to three feet deep. So that was our deepest section. And then this area up here was very shallow. And this little bridge here in the middle was the most shallow part. So um, part of that pool, the, the part uh, closest to you, in the, or in the lower section of the slide, that shallow would effectively become isolated and dry up um, almost every summer. Whereas the, the deeper section of the pool um, actually has um, held water year round, I think, since we created it. For us, that was important because we weren't just providing habitat. We also wanted the, to use these pools as uh, places for education and for workshops where people could go. So we wanted there to be hands-on opportunities to uh, capture animals and, and um, do some activities year-round. But by trying to create a variety of different water levels, um, scenarios we're trying to provide habitat for a variety of animals. Um, and Let's see. So we're trying to mimic, kind of mimic natural habitats rather than just a pond, um, you know, a deep pond that's more artificial. Trying to mimic what would happen more naturally. Okay, Terry, you're having a problem with the picture. Is anybody else having a problem? Okay, can everybody else still see the picture? Had to move away. Everybody else's picture is okay. Um, Terry, do you think it may have been your, the window might be minimized? 
I can see it yet. It's still okay. Everybody else seems okay. Okay, the sixth step is to, um, again, mimicking natural habitats, try to include, um, you know, make the edges more shallow and kind of sinuous or snaking and instead of just a circular pond. The more edge habitat, you know, the more linear distance you can provide along the edge of a pond, the more cover there is for the animals as they move out of the pond or as, you know, for the adults as they're moving in back and forth uh, from the pond to the woods. Um, and also, Having the the uh, edges be shallow is, is uh, beneficial um, in the way that so that it doesn't provide a barrier to to moving out from the pond. So just like the ruts, a deep rut nearby would be a barrier. Then a a very steep drop off along the edges would be a barrier to uh, smaller animals moving in and back. Okay, Saul so asked what kind of animals we got the first year. Um, we were really actually amazed that we got. Um, well, green frogs showed up before we were even done digging, and that's pretty typical. They, you know, they use just about, they're very much generalists. They're probably our most common frog, and um, they move across the landscape pretty readily, it seems like. But uh, we thought it would take a while for the other animals, the, the vernal woodland pool dependent species, to find the pools. But we had wood frogs the first year, first spring, and we also um, have had spotted salamanders. We had them the, the first year as well, which we were really surprised by. Um, the other um, thing, let's see, we, we did see a wood turtle in the vicinity of one of our pools the, the uh, first, second summer, I think, and we saw that wood turtle a couple of different times. So and we had deer, and we had turkeys dusting on the berms, and I know just uh, bats feeding over the the pools, so uh, we really did have um, a lot of different animals using using the pools. Okay. Okay. The seventh uh, step to be uh, careful of is to beware of fish. Now, a lot of people um, are interested in having ponds uh, because they want to have fish and and that's fine, but in a shallow woodland pool, if you want to really cre uh, provide the best habitat for those organisms that depend on them, you want to be aware of dropping fish in there of, of any sort. Just something to keep in, in mind. Um, the eighth step, and probably really, really important, is to add organic matter. So I mentioned before that we put the topsoil back on the berm, but we also threw in some roots and some logs and uh, some sticks for egg attachment sites. A lot of the animals, like uh, spotted salamanders, will attach their eggs to a stick or of debris. And the organic matter, again, provides a base of food for the, the invertebrates to feed on, which then provides additional food. Well, that's a good tip. Linda mentions you might also want to sign, put a sign up at the site to discourage people from dumping fish in. And yes, that, I agree that would be a good idea. And then the last step is uh, that you can add plants to these uh, pools. And what we did was we just added plants, you know, native plants that were already established in nearby pools um, to, to the pools that we had. So it didn't really cost us anything. And we knew we were using plants that were adapted to that, that area. And um, so we just threw in a few wetland plants that we had growing in nearby areas. And that provided some, you know, some cover. You want to make sure that you, you know what plants you're moving, though. You don't want to uh, um, risk uh, planting invasive plants that might take over your, your woodland pool and, and become problematic. Um, all right, and the tenth step is to enjoy. Um, we had a workshop that we did at the Arnott Forest uh, on creating woodland pools, and uh, a couple that had attended the workshop basically went back and created a pool almost immediately. And then they wrote, uh, the ponds drew attention from the wildlife before they even had water. What a theater of activity these ponds have become. They beckon us to pull up a seat and sit a while. And I think that just, I love that, because it really summarizes you know, the fact that they provide excellent habitat and also a really nice place for, for people to go and sit and, and enjoy wildlife and, and uh, kind of connect with nature.
Okay, Dakota asks, is there a reference source to help identify invasive species in New England woodland pools? Um, I don't think there's anything that specific um, in terms of, of invasive species. You know, a lot of a lot of woodland pools won't even have vegetation, so it's not, um, you know, or I, I'm, it's, as long as there's a closed canopy and it's not disturbed, then um, usually there's not too much of an issue with invasives. The invasives that I've seen most often will be shrubs that have moved in, um, things like uh, barberry and um, let's see what else, honeysuckle and that type of thing. So I think if you just look on, there's a invasive Plants Council in New York State, and I think something like that might just point you to, in general, to invasive species. Uh, let's see. We also have somebody who asked a question: What concern is there for these pools to harbor mosquitoes in West Nile? And that's an excellent question. Um, there's, uh, you know, we knew as we created these pools that there would be the question would would come up about West Nile virus and mosquitoes right away. So we actually had a an intern, one of the interns that helped build some of the pools. Uh, the following year did uh, some research on mosquitoes. Uh, we had noticed that mosquito larvae moved in right away to the pools, but then they, they disappeared. And uh, we had, in some of the pools, the research pools, we had put uh, spotted salamander larvae in as soon as we built the pools um, to do some experimentation. And we noticed that as soon as they went in, that the mosquito larvae disappeared. And in, in times following that, we really didn't seem to have an issue. But what what uh, Nick did for his research was he took the the uh, spotted salamander larvae, which are less than you know, an inch long, and he put one in each dish and he'd feed them as many mosquito larvae as they could eat at one time you know, a day. And um, by the time they were you know, about uh, a little more than an inch long, they were eating on average 40 mosquito larvae per day. And I think the, the highest number was like 100 a day. So you can imagine um, I think the conclusion that we came to from this was that as long as you have, um, you know, an, an ecosystem that's kind of intact and functioning well, that that uh, mosquitoes aren't going to be too much of an issue because you have, you know, predators for those mosquitoes right there in the pool. And in fact, they'd even um, provide, you know, uh, mosquito larvae actually would provide food for those organisms that would, uh, in turn, then eat them and keep them from developing. Um, I just want to summarize here. I, uh, we created a woodland pool steward program this last spring to kind of encourage people to um, look for woodland pools out in their communities or on their properties and and uh, document the locations and some of the organisms, animals that were in them, and send them to us so that we could try to accumulate more information about woodland pools in New York State and what the status of the pools were, what animals were using them. And so if anybody would like to participate, um, I put our website, um, our web address there on the screen, www.woodlandpools.info. We have data sheets on that site and also some links to some additional publications on uh, creating vertical woodland pools and, um, and uh, just so, some other information in general. So if you'd like to explore this topic a little bit more, I encourage you to visit that website. And uh, one final question from Sally, what is the best time of year to create a pool? I would say uh, summer when it's dry would be the best time of year to create the pool. Then you're not, um, you know, it's it's cleaner. You're not really disturbing things as much as you might if, if there's a lot of uh, moisture in the area. So I would say um, probably during the dry season. Okay, and uh, I think that summarizes the information for today. And uh, Pete has said they're giving you the uh, the website if you'd like to visit the recorded webcast at forestconnect.info. And I thank you all for your participation. And now I think uh, Pete's going to put up a webcast. I mean, a uh, another um, survey. Another poll. Yep. Thank you, Christy. That was a great job. And there was a lot of uh, wonderful questions from everyone. So. Um, as we as we close this down, the, the two things that we need you to do, one is to take this last poll, and also if you are uh, interested in obtaining continuing forestry education credits, uh, make sure that I have your name. Right now I have Martin Jones, Ron Farr, Sally Butler, and Terry Marino. 
if there was uh, if there's anyone else that wants me to record their name with with the Society of American Foresters, please uh, put a note into the chat pod and I'll add your name. And then you need to go to the SAF website, uh, safnet.org, I think. Uh, click on Certified Forester and then look in the New York SAF page for this date. So we're getting some good responses here. Um, I'd also like to point out that we have uh, the next webcast is scheduled for Wednesday, November 21st. Uh, and I don't recall off the top of my head what that topic is. It's a, it's a, um, I think it, it may be on forest, it's either on forest regeneration or on avoiding high grading. So the, the specific title is on forestconnect.info. We're also in the process of starting to um, uh, accumulate topics for 2008. So please, um, you know, if you have ideas, please send me an email with, uh, and the more specific you can, you can get with the topic is, is better. You know, so don't don't send a topic on wildlife, but say, you know, vernal pool wildlife or grouse management or uh, water quality BMPs or something like that. So. Uh, and you all should have my email address. Okay, um, Christy, you're you're still here. It looks like so. If there are, um, we'll officially let me close the poll and um, record those answers. Um, if there are other questions, though, Christy and I can stick around for another few minutes. So please feel free to to shoot those questions in if anybody has them. Okay, I see. Um, Bob asked if you can get copies of the presentation, and uh, yes, actually, I'd be happy to. I think it's it's too large to email, but I'd be happy to put it on a CD and send it to you if you want to email me your address. We, we may be able to, Christy, to compress it and then put it on the Forest Connect website, which we've done with some of the other earlier presentations on the webcasts. Um, and then the saved version is also the the recorded version, so you can go back and replay this presentation with the with the, um, the audio intact. So that's another option. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, let's see some other areas. How long? Bob asked, "How long should water remain in the pool?" Um, let's see. Things like uh, spotted salamanders, the larvae take about six to eight weeks. So. Um, June and July, at, at least through the, for wood frogs, probably through the end of June, and for spotted salamanders, maybe till the end of July. Um, is it better to just let the native vegetation eventually cover any bare soil? Um, let's see, Robert, I, we planted in one area that we thought was pretty prone to being eroded. We planted just some annual ryegrass, something to stabilize the soil, but that would not grow via perennial. So that you know gave it a year to hold it intact until native vegetation moved in. And that seemed to work really well for us. Chris and Ron. Yeah. No, I was go just ahead, gonna Pete. see if you could respond to Ron's question about permits. Um, I would say it. you should probably look into permits, to local permits that are required for any of these. I think it depends on the amount of soil that you move, and it, that's oftentimes dependent on local regulations. So um, I would definitely look into it before you know you, you move any large amounts who would of they, soil. That's with the state agency or soil and water, or who would the likely group be? Um, well, you can check with DEC, first of all, and then you could, for state regulations, and then um, maybe your local towns would be another place. Or soil and water would probably know the regulations very, very well and could, could point you to who the local contact would be in your area. Pete, can you email Terry the survey for her to, to answer the questions? Um, yes, I think. <laughs> Okay. All right, so Terry, we will try. Um, and Dakota, is there a commercial source of salamander larvae? Uh, that's a really good question. You know, after we did the mosquito research, we started thinking, wow, this is, you know, would be a great biological control. But at this point, I think 
no, there isn't. And there would be some concerns. Um, you know, there are concerns about moving organisms from one area to another just because of mixing genetics and things like that. So, um, so at this point, I would say no. Okay, it looks like we've uh, we've uh, hit all the the hot questions anyway. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for participating, and my thanks again to Christy for a wonderful job. We'll be back again live tonight at 7 p.m. on a slightly different uh, URL address. Um, you're all probably figured out the pattern by now, but check your email and uh, and if. You can come back again a second time if you want, um, and uh, if not, then we'll see you on November 21st. Have a great evening, and I'm now going to close this meeting.